everyone. Welcome back to the Level 10 YouTube channel. My name is Alex Mazurko. I am an assistant coach at Level 10. We are here to talk all about gut health. I am joined by Ari and Courtney, and I will let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Ari Fiorita. I am a nutrition coach with Level 10, and I specialize in integrative and functional nutrition. I'm Courtney Thomas, and I am an assistant coach with a level 10, um, and I help women with hormones, gut issues, and autoimmune issues. So as you can see, we are all um, big fans of gut health here. Um, and so I want to start off by talking about the some of the health issues that um, we see pop up when we have gut issues um, and what some of those issues could be. So um, Ari or Courtney, what are the main gut issues that you typically see pop up with clients? Yeah, I can start. So uh, a lot of common issues I see are a lot of what's defined as like IBS. And sometimes that's like a catch-all for just a myriad of digestive symptoms, anything from bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation, uh, those are probably the primary concerns, but I think it's important to, to kind of talk about, you know, what's related to certain like foods that they're eating versus what is actually like a disorder and kind of differentiating between, you know, what's more problematic and what's something that we can just address through lifestyle modifications. I, I think, oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Courtney. I was just going to say some things that I typically see with clients too, when they have gut issues that they don't, we don't often think about, like we often think about like the, the constipation, the diarrhea, the bloating, but we don't think about how, you know, acne or psoriasis or eczema. Um, I see a, like brain fog too, can be connected to gut health. And that's a really big one for a lot of people um, and fatigue. So I think we often don't connect these other things that are seemingly unrelated to our gut health when a root cause is our, our gut. So. Along with anxiety and depression, yes. Yes. Um, our mental health um, is extremely connected to our digestive health. Um, it's funny you mentioned psoriasis. My husband loves to tell me he doesn't have gut issues and yet he has psoriasis and it's made worse when he... <laughs> binges on uh, Reese's cups at night. So um, I'm like, you think you would know better and listen to your uh, health coach wife. I like the quote, like someone always said, you know, just like Las Vegas, what start, what, what's happened in the gut doesn't stay in the gut. Mm -hmm. And it's so true. It is. That's a really good one. <laughs> um, Ari, I love what you said about IBS being a catch-all. And I, I mentioned this in the email that I wrote for level 10 last week, but there's this frustration that, oh, you just have irritable bowel syndrome. And I'm always like, well, what is the irritant? What is the accelerant that we're throwing on the fire? And what are some, some swaps or lifestyle changes that we can make that might start to improve IBS or a catch-all diagnosis? Yeah, a lot of things that I like to talk about are kind of like the pillars. So I think of diet, nutrition, like diet and nutrition, exercise, sleep, and stressors. And stressors can be a number of different things, but like looking about like how somebody is managing their stress, both psychologically and physically. So it can be also related to somebody that's going out and like doing a ton of like marathon training or like kind of like the overtraining scenario that can also contribute to a lot of gut health issues. Um, I see this a lot of times with like my runners, they're running and they're experiencing lots of like diarrhea and like IBS symptoms when really it's just uh, taking a step back, looking at not only like, are they getting enough recovery? Are they getting enough sleep? Uh, sleep is critical for healing our digestive tract and really our entire body. And so, you know, if we're not feeling appropriately is another big one. So certain types of foods, but also just under fueling can really affect our hormone levels, which can also materialize as gut, um, gut health issues. So hopefully that kind of answered your question. Anything to add, Courtney? No, I think that's, I, I think stress is a big one that's often overlooked. And a lot of times people just want the protocols and, but they're not, you know, if you're not addressing nutrition, making sure that you're eating enough, if you're not addressing your stressors, then it's really, really hard to heal. 
Um, and so oftentimes just taking care of those things first and making sure that those are taken care of, um, you can fix and improve a lot of gut issues without having to do the fancy, expensive, in-depth protocols. There's so much we can do with proper nutrition, a little bit of sleep and rest. And I, I don't mean rest in terms of sleep. I find that the people who often have the, the most gut issues are the, the type A, go, go, go. I never sit down. I've got to train five, six, seven days a week. Um, I, I, I have to do more all the time. And it's really hard for those people to, to sit down and do less, but that's where the body heals. Yes. That's a um, and, I have with a lot of clients, like rest can actually be one of the most productive things you can do. I, I went through it myself. I had to stop training for four months. And so I always say to clients, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to just make you sit down for fun. Like you're going to feel better, um, when you can take a break and mentally, even the, the clarity, the fatigue, the mood, the anxiety, the depression. Um, if you can find another outlet for your stress, I think people are like, well, exercise is my outlet. Well, we have to find other outlets and often our mental health improves just as much as our physical health. Absolutely. Yeah. We need other tools in the toolbox for that stress management, which go listen to the stress management YouTube that we did <laughs> a couple of weeks yes. ago. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we've kind of touched on this, but um, people are always like, how, how do I know if I have digestive issues? And I think most people don't even know what the Bristol stool chart is. So I, I try to point them there. We're looking for number fours, Google the, the Bristol stool chart. If, um, I don't know, Shelby, can you put a link in the show notes? Um, but, uh, it's, it's not just bloating or constipation or diarrhea. There are other symptoms. So what do you guys normally or, or not normally see or people that don't associate them with gut issues, but they might be? That's a good question. Like literally I always come back to gut health, um, as a starting point because it just, it is really the root of everything. So a lot of times, even so much as like migraines, headaches, seasonal allergies is a big one right now that a lot of times we'll start with, um, the digestive tract, especially with the histamine response and some of those enzymes that help to break down, um, those responses. And so I think that, uh, those are kind of some of the lesser known uh, or like less common symptoms associated with gut health. And then joint pain, muscle pain, especially in those with autoimmune conditions. We know that those who have like one autoimmune condition are more likely to develop more, especially if we have intestinal permeability or as we call like leaky gut. And so really addressing gut health first is always like my low hanging fruit. And once somebody has that, you know, kind of in, in focus and they've done a lot of that groundwork, which I'm not saying it's easy, it definitely takes time. Then we can start to focus a little bit on some of the, the other things that we can do that are maybe a little bit more like a specific protocol or specific, you know, supplementation, things that get a little bit more nitty gritty, but if they don't have their diet and their nutrition and their gut health in focus first, you really won't benefit from doing some of the other things. We mentioned um, some skin issues like psoriasis, eczema, um, acne, um, even like just dehydration. I think when we're hydrated and we're eating nutrient dense foods, Ari wrote a great email on um, phytonutrients. We, our skin's just brighter and clearer and hydrated. I think that comes down to eating a diet rich and whole nutritious fibrous foods um, and, and steering away from the processed foods, which is, is obvious in terms of gut health. Um, Courtney, what are some of the things that you see that people might not associate with gut issues, but are? Um, in terms of like symptoms and symptoms or yeah. So I, I think we kind of touched on a lot of them, you know, I, again, with like autoimmune 
diseases and, you know, skin issues, brain fog, like I already touched on a lot of them. And I think that's, that's what I see a lot of too. Um, but in terms of just like basic things, like you said, hydrating enough. One thing that I work with uh, that I have clients focus on is we talk about fiber a lot and making sure that we're eating enough fiber. And that is what feeds the good bacteria in our gut. And we need an, an adequate amount of fiber, but also a diverse from diverse sources. So we're not just eating fiber one bars or getting tortilla shells with more fiber in them. We want like the colorful fruits and veggies and different types of fiber in our diet to help populate the good bacteria in our gut and create an environment where that good bacteria can thrive and potentially, and hopefully overpopulate the bad bacteria in our gut. Yeah, I guess as you were talking, Courtney, I was kind of thinking too, like a lot of people that have things like insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome, like there's lots of bacterial strains that are actually associated with how we, um, you know, with metabolic syndrome in general, specifically one called acromancia, which is kind of becoming more popular in, in the media. And so I think that for anyone that even has um, insulin resistance or even high cholesterol, when you're talking about fibers, all of that can be you know, really mitigated in part, at least by correcting some of the gut imbalances. I'm, I'm team fiber. <laughs> um, I, I have like a, a minimum 35 gram goal for my clients. And um, that, that might seem high to the average American who's eating 10 grams of fiber every day, but I really encourage them um, diverse fruits, diverse veggies, uh, but I'm a big fan of fab four smoothies, which liquids in the morning, that's definitely going to help ease your, your digestive tract. Um, it, it's already blended up and there's no chewing involved. So super easy, uh, but you can pack a lot of fiber into a smoothie in terms of chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp hearts, nuts, uh, fruit, vegetables. Um, you know, say you don't like your spinach, you, you can hide it in a smoothie. So if you're struggling to get fiber in, um, I am team smoothie. Um, what are some other go-to kind of gut friendly foods or recipes that you guys recommend to clients? I'm going to go ahead and start Ari. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So I kind of think of a couple of different things when I'm thinking about like gut healthy foods. One is the fibers that we were talking about. So making sure that they're getting a wide variety of prebiotic fibers. So prebiotic fibers are going to be things like cruciferous vegetables, dark berries, um, also things like garlic and a lot of our like herbs and spices. And then fermented foods, of course. So we think there of like sauerkraut, kimchi, probiotic uh, type pickles. So if you're doing like the pickles that are in the refrigerated section versus just, you know, the vinegar pickles, uh, kombucha for some people, you know, you have to watch out for some of the added sugars. And if somebody's got a lot of like yeast infections and things that might not be the best choice, but just a wide variety of fermented foods. Um, also there's some benefits of getting polyphenols. So things like green tea, uh, your blueberries, cranberries, pomegranate, <laughs> Acai. What'd you say, Alex? Wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. And so that has some synergistic effects with, with some of our uh, prebiotics as well to kind of help um, boost that, those benefits further. That's a great list. Um, for powder. What did you say? Cocoa powder, I guess, is another one. So for those who like chocolate, that could be a good addition to your smoothie. A uh, green tea is another one that I always forget about. It, green tea is super high in antioxidants, polyphenols. Um, yeah, it, it's a lot of people. What, 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 what do we say to the people who are like, well, I, I do eat, you know, a whole foods. I, um, I do take rest days. I do manage my stress. What, what are some of the, the things that we start to talk about when we've hit the, the basics? Are we adding in probiotics? Um, are, are we adding in certain supplements? Um, where do we go if someone feels like they've, they've done the basics? Courtney, I'll let you start on this one. Okay. 
Um, if someone's already kind of done the basics, I making sure that they're eating enough food. I think we kind of already touched on that, but I think when you are eating a lot of whole foods, it's easy to under eat because they're more filling. And so making sure that we're eating an adequate amount of food is like number one. The other thing that I think is helpful for some people is auditing where your fats are coming from. So if we're eating a lot of canola oil or really processed oils, um, soybean oil, like corn oil that are in things like our dressings and mayonnaise, and it's just really easy to consume those if we're not being careful, but those are really inflammatory and those can cause issues in a lot of people. Um, so auditing those little things, I start kind of paying attention to and keeping a food journal. Um, and there are some clients that it's helpful to do an elimination diet and kind of go to basics, or, you know, we start looking at doing a low FODMAP diet for a period of time to see if they feel better. And that can kind of give us an idea of, okay, there might be more going on that we need to look into. Do we have a bacterial overgrowth? Is there bacteria in the small intestine where we don't really want a lot of bacteria? Um, based on if they feel better. And I always like preface with clients, like if we do an elimination diet, it's, this is not to be permanent. This is, should never be a long-term thing. The idea is to do it short-term and see if we can identify if there's anything in your diet that you're eating, that's contributing to your symptoms. So once those basics are already done, then that's when I kind of start looking a little bit deeper to see if there's other things that, you know, we need to address, but we always start with the basics first because a lot of times that fixes so many things. Yeah, for sure. I I tend to always go back and Courtney, you may have heard of this. This is kind of piggybacking off of a lot of what you were just talking about. But uh, we often use like what's called a five R approach. Mm -hmm. So you focus on like removing certain things, um, you know, that might be certain food triggers. I think that kind of starts with starting like a food journal or at least tracking your food and like finding some of those associations and figuring out if it's, hold on, if, yeah, figuring out if it's starting from like um, a deficiency in certain enzymes or a deficiency in certain, um, like for example, lactose intolerance, you might need a little bit more, you might be lacking lactase or, uh, you know, kind of digging a little bit deeper and figuring out like where the problem lies. And I think like the, the other thing that's really important is like how they're eating. So like, are they chewing their food really well? Are they like eating in the car on the run and just like eating to eat? Or are they actually like taking a couple deep breaths, chewing their food and then, you know, swallowing when it's at that, like a mashed potato consistency is usually what I say. Uh, Cause that's going to kind of prep your digestive tract and kind of get some of those enzymes and those digestive juices flowing so that you can actually absorb those nutrients uh, in a better, better way. I'm so glad you brought that up, Ari, because that was like the theme and check-ins yesterday. It was like, how are we eating? <laughs> because your body, like we know about the, our different nervous system states, like we have rest and digest and we have fight or flight. And so if we're constantly stressed, we are not going to be able to divert resources to proper digestion. Um, so that's going to make a big impact on, on your overall digestion. For sure. Yeah. My dogs obviously agree. <laughs> Uh, I think when we eat and how we're eating those, those are two big ones. Um, and, and I, this kind of slipped my mind, which has been a, a common theme in my check-ins is heartburn. And oftentimes we think that we have this overproduction of acid when we have heartburn, but often it's, it's usually an underproduction of acid because we're living in this stressed state. Um, and so we, we need to get unstressed and into our parasympathetic state. So we actually start producing acid so we can actually digest and break down some of that food. Um, but the, these are, are great suggestions to kind of audit and go a little bit deeper. Um, I always think adding in something like a digestive enzyme, I'm a big fan of aloe vera juice in the morning, um, kind of cooling, anti-inflammatory, um, can also get things moving um, if, if people feel stuck. So those are our two kind of low hanging supplements that, that aren't too intense or expensive. Um, or there's a product called Sun Fiber that you can get on Amazon if clients are really struggling um, or even just uh, heating or, or making their, their rice, their sweet potato, um, their regular potatoes, their carb sources or their starch sources, 
um, and then cooling them, that can help to create more resistant starch, more prebiotic fiber. So little things that we can do to take it a step further. Um, I always say dairy, alcohol, added sugars, um, gluten, and then those meals out are, are certainly things to watch out for because they're cooking with those higher inflammatory, higher omega-6 oils. And so people are like, oh, I ate out five, six times last week. I mean, you know, that's, even if it fits into your macros, they're usually cooking, um, with, with lower quality ingredients and oils, and, and that's going to lead to some inflammation and upset. Yeah, I think, you know, I started to talk about the 5R approach. I never really like finished what that even means. Um, so I realized that like, you know, I think this could be a good checklist for like coaches or just people who are working with with uh, individuals who might be concerned about their gut health. You know, the first R really stands for remove. So that's where you guys were talking about like maybe an elimination diet, like a low FODMAP or removing um, other triggers like addressing stress, removing, you know, looking at infections, toxins, fermentable carbohydrates. Um, and then we talk about like replacing. So anytime you remove something from your diet, we have to replace it with um, things that really either help with digestion, like digestive enzymes, replenishing nutrient deficiencies, you know, things like that. Um, and then repairing it. So Alex, this is where you were kind of talking a little bit about like supplementation, especially like aloe vera to kind of help soothe the digestive tract, making sure that they're having things like zinc, you know, glutamine, those are obviously things that they would want to talk about, you know, with a practitioner that's, that's comfortable with those things. But that's where we also talk about like repairing our parasympathetic tone. So like, that's where like activating our vagus nerve through like the deep belly breathing and things like that come in. Um, and then re-inoculating with things like probiotics, making sure that they're getting, you know, enough good bacteria to really recreate that balance because our digestive tract is in flux all the time. And so when we take care of it and when we give it what it needs, it's, it's going to, you know, really work to your favor and allow you to, to feel your best. But then if you go out for, you know, a weekend of drinking all weekend, or you're like over caffeinating, even just a couple of days of not taking care of yourself can kind of shift that bacterial balance in the wrong direction. So I just want to make sure that like I mentioned the R5R protocol, but that's kind of what we're looking for. And we can kind of think of that as like a checklist when somebody already might be like optimized in other ways with their diet. That's awesome. Ari, thanks. I love that you brought that up. Um, in terms of exercise, um, if, if someone doesn't want to completely rest, um, I'm a big fan of adding in yoga and walks and, and both of those things are exercise. I know some of my type A clients say they're boring and they're not, but, um, those, those are two things that can really help with mindfulness and keeping you in your parasympathetic state, but also you're, you're moving your body without feeling like you have to beat your body up. So um, in terms of exercise, I love to see clients um, dive into yoga and prioritize their daily walks, preferably outside in, in the sunshine um, when they, they're trying to heal, but they, they also want to train. Uh, but I think it's important to meet clients where they are. So whether we're, we're cutting back on training or we're, if we're removing a training session, can we add in a yoga session, you know, remove, add something back in things like that. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in there in terms of exercise that maybe we don't have to completely eliminate it, but, but we could try something else that's going to be, be more beneficial less orange theory and more <laughs> yoga, <laughs> the, the running, the orange theory, uh -huh. the uh, CrossFit. CrossFit. <laughs> yep. I remember when I was going through, I was working with a coach and I was doing a lot of CrossFit and he's like, Courtney, I want you to do more walking. I want you to do more yoga. And I really remember saying like, that sounds so boring. Um, <laughs> That's why I needed it more. <laughs> now I love those things. So it helps. I feel like when we can get clients to slow down, event, they're like, we talked about this on the stress management call, but you know, I've had clients be like, well, I finally love my walks. And like, or TikTok told me to go, I'm like, I told you to go on a walk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but when it's cool on TikTok, you know? Yeah. Sometimes you need to hear it from somebody else. <laughs> 
Yeah. And I think it's helpful to remember that like exercise is good for gut health, but it's like dose dependent, just like anything else. So like the right amount of exercise and even like high intensity training at the right amount for that individual person can be really helpful for producing certain types of gut bacteria. But then if you overdo it and kind of overstep that line, then it becomes detrimental. So I think it's about finding that, that balance between pushing yourself, but also listening to body and like focusing on recovery and, and really making sure that you're finding the best thing for you. Yeah. I like that you said that because it's not that these things are bad. Um, and I would never want to discourage somebody from doing something they love or moving in a way that they enjoy, but yeah, it, I agree with you. It's a balance. It is a balance. And I say that every single day in my check-ins to clients. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always, you know, gut healing is, is a, a very mental thing. And we talked about or you talked about how eliminating foods is, is not a forever thing, but there's, there can be this fear of food, um, or this fear of exercise, um, when you're going through a, a healing journey. Um, so what are some of the ways you guys talk clients through that or, or reintroduce foods, um, when the time is right? Yeah, I think, for me, like a lot of times, if I, if I'm putting somebody through like an elimination diet at the beginning of that, like we set expectations of like how long this is going to last and when we're going to start reintroducing foods. And for a lot of people, it's maybe four to six weeks and then reassessing because sometimes, you know, that's enough. And sometimes, you know, they're not really seeing the results that they want to, or there's something still going on that you have to, you know, maybe play around with it a little bit longer. But for most people, I don't really recommend more than about four, four weeks or so, because that's kind of like the threshold of what people can, can do successfully. And then I start slowly reintroducing foods uh, to, to monitor for symptoms. So this is where like the food log is really important again. Uh, but I also think that like, you know, people hear of elimination diets and they think that they have to eliminate all these things at once when really it might just be like eliminating one or two foods at a time and seeing if that helps. Maybe it's just, you know, switching the types of fats that you're doing, like Courtney said, you know, it doesn't have to be something that's like this big, long drawn out elimination diet, like they might see on, you know, somebody did on social media. So I think ex setting expectations is, is number one, uh, level of importance for me is like, this is not long-term. This is, this is the intention of the elimination diet. This is why we're doing it. And if it's not working, we're not going to keep you in that. We're going to try something else. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I approach it very much the same way Ari mentioned, you know, and, and the reintroduction, sometimes when you start feeling really good, once you do an elimination diet, it can kind of be feel scary to start reintroducing new foods because you're like, I feel really good. I don't want this to stop. Um, but we have to know that it's important. Like the overall goal is to not be restricted for the rest of your life. It's to eat a diverse amount of foods. And so it's almost more, I, I try and let clients know, like once you are finished and you, we've reintroduced foods, you have a better idea of what you can and can't tolerate and, and you can make more informed choices. So it's almost more empowering instead of like, I feel like crap all the time and I don't know what's causing it. You can make those informed choices of like, okay, I can eat this and I know what the consequence is going to be. Is it worth it? And you get to make that, that empowered choice. So we can kind of get around some of those food fears by framing it as like, this is, this is how we gain knowledge about our body and what's working for our body and what isn't. I like that. Yeah. And I, I think, um, how much of a food. So, you know, yeah. some, some people are like, oh, I can get away with, you know, a, a w one scoop of ice cream a week, or I can get away with a few drinks. But if I go to Vegas and, you know, have a great time for five days, I, I overdo it. So that's the other thing that's like, it, and that goes for, for macros in general, you know, you can have things, but you might not be able to have everything or at, all at once, um, which is, it comes back to balance. It's a great way to, to look at things, um, everything in moderation or just being able to know what is, is causing what. Um, as we wrap things up, do you guys have any final um, thoughts? Um, I know we talked a little bit before this about um, adding probiotics in uh, probiotics versus food. Ari, do you have um, thoughts on that you want to discuss? 
Yeah, I just, I wanted to just mention it because I get this question a lot is if like, should I take a probiotic? And when somebody asks me if they should be on a probiotic, I always ask them first what their diet looks like and if they're incorporating fermented foods or other sources of probiotics. Generally, I recommend starting with like one to two tablespoons of at least one or two different sources per day to kind of get their feet wet and like explore different types of fermented foods. I know a lot of people are like, ooh, I don't, I'm not going to try sauerkraut, but I'm like, wait, well, have you tried like other fermented vegetables or have you tried it in different ways? Like you don't have to sit there and eat a plate of sauerkraut. Um, and so I think that encouraging them to get it from foods first is preferred just because it has a lot of those synergistic effects. Like you're going to get lots of benefits from foods that you wouldn't necessarily get from just a supplement, but there's also a time and a place for supplementation. And I think that, you know, having some of those targeted strains can really help, especially after a course of antibiotics or for somebody that's going through like a major stressful time in their life, they might need a little bit of extra support there. So I think it's time and a place and it's definitely a discussion to have like with your coach or your, your practitioner that you're working with. Um, but I'm always kind of a food first approach type of person. I love that. And shout out to Cleveland Kitchen. Ari and I are both from Cleveland, but there is a company called Cleveland Kitchen that um, has a, a wide variety of sauerkraut products and, and kimchi products. So um, try them out. Great on just about everything. Love it. Uh, Courtney, any final thoughts from you? I think we covered a lot today um, and hopefully that can kind of give people a good starting point of what to focus on if they're dealing with gut issues um, and, you know, starting with foods first and lifestyle first, I think that can make a big difference in, in people's ability to heal and feel better. Yeah, that, that stress management and often increasing our, our whole foods um, that those are easy places to start and they truly make a big, big difference. So thank you guys for your time. Um, if you guys have questions, drop them below and have a wonderful day.